Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Ritorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Chris Galliers, and he is the CEO for the International Ranger Federation. Before we start launching into the questions, I'm going to show a quick video so the people watching back home um, can get a bit of an idea and understanding of some of the work that they're doing. We are rangers. We come from many backgrounds. We live and work all around the world doing many different and often difficult jobs. We may be volunteers, employees, indigenous and local community members, or government officers. We may work as monitors, managers, educators, or defenders. But all of us are guardians of natural, cultural, and historical heritage, committed to working together with our communities to respect and protect the world's treasures for future generations to enjoy. We are nature's health professionals, taking on the challenge to save, restore, improve, protect, and maintain the vitality of our planet. Now, rangers from all over the world are coming together to support each other in this vital work. More than 1,800 rangers from more than 60 countries have worked with the International Ranger Federation to create the Ranger Code of Conduct. The code provides a template to establish global standards, principles of practice, to help protect us from threat and harmful influence, and to inspire us to excellence in everything that we do. To succeed in this goal, it needs to be adapted by rangers to local needs, shared and implemented worldwide. I absolutely love that video. I think it gives me goosebumps every time I see it. There's actually a longer version that people can watch back home. I think that's on your website. Is that right, Chris? Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, so Chris, if we can then hand over to you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in conservation? Yeah, thanks Kathleen. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity. And um, yeah, I think growing up, uh, I, I'm based in, in South Africa and uh, I grew up in the rural areas of South Africa um, and South Africa is blessed with incredible landscapes, biodiversity, etc. Um, you know, it's uh, classified as, um, you know, we've got three different biodiversity hotspots and so on. And I think just in that uh, living out in the rural areas growing up uh, sort of in the farming life, um, it exposed me to, to nature. And I think through that, um, I then studied uh, in in nature in a nature degree uh, and that showed the the challenges that nature faces and not only that it faces currently but going into the future um, and so i felt that i really wanted to be part of trying to make a difference you know, we, we live on this planet for a short time but that short time um, we can make a, a huge impact both negative and positive uh, and so, yeah, I think it's about trying to make the biggest difference we can uh, to ensure that what we have here is here forever. Um, so, it, so as a result of that, it's uh, it, it's it was a sort of uh, a passion, um, and that's why it's uh, it, it was an easy step forward into the conservation arena. And for those who are watching back home and they might not be aware of what the International Ranger Federation is, can you talk to us a little bit about what it is, what it stands for? Sure, the International Ranger Federation, um, it's, it's got an interesting sort of history. Uh, it started in uh, on the 31st of July, 1992. Um, a number of rangers came together uh, in, um, in, in the UK and, uh, and decided that this needed to, to be taken further to support rangers to create a network globally um, so that's on the 31st of july that's when it was established and um, hence we have world ranger day which is now celebrated on the 31st of july so it gives a bit of context to to that uh, the federation uh, is its uh, mission is to develop and advance promote throughout the world um, community the ranger profession and its critical role in the conservation of natural and cultural resources uh, it's 
as it says, a federation. It's made up of a number of, um, it's got a membership um, and different membership categories. And uh, its structure at the moment, we've got regional associations, a range of associations, and then that goes down to national and then subnational associations and uh, that allows us to have that global reach and allows us to have that reach really from the from a high level global perspective right down to a ranger on the ground uh, and in so doing uh, the, the aim is to be able to allow those rangers that are at ground on the on the front line um, they have access to that global level um, so that their voice can be heard uh, because uh, rangers by nature are often operating in places that are, are, are quite disconnected um, and and so communication and you know access to, to putting their views and experiences and situations forward are quite difficult and so that's that's where we need to have that sort of direct link uh, from from the ranger um, right on the on the ground level to the to the global level um, the membership structure we've got um, over well, close on 80 uh, different uh, well ranger associations uh, they classified as full members and we've got provisional members as well uh, so th those are ones that are, are in development um, we've got over 65 different countries uh, represented as our members uh, so yeah, I think the, the the whole aim of the of the International Ranger Federation is to provide that that voice for rangers, uh, be the global voice for rangers, and that has come through many different uh, areas where we've had the uh, international um, the the ranger congresses, the World Ranger Congresses that have taken place since the establishment of the International Ranger Federation. And there's been nine of them, uh, and they've taken place in different parts of the world. And that has created and strengthened the sense of community um, of rangers. And um, and really, it's it's been a, a great opportunity for, for rangers to share their experiences with rangers. And it's possibly a little bit of a cliche to, to say that it's a sort of a ranger family. Um, but it, but it is no one understands a ranger better than another ranger, and so that's why it it, it really is that uh, community of practice that's been developed, and um, it has also strengthened I think the 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 support that rangers can get from other rangers, and uh, it fast tracks learning, um, and uh, also allows us to really advance the ranger profession based on the real needs that are coming from the ground up. And you've said before um, in the past, and also uh, it touched on it in the video as well, that rangers are our planetary health frontline workers. Can you kind of detail what you meant by this and, and why they are so important? Yeah, so obviously we we I mean we we're still in the, the, the sort of COVID pandemic situation, and uh, that's that really has realised uh, brought a lot of things to the fore over this period. And we had the last World Ranger Congress in 2019 uh, in Nepal, and it was very soon after that that the world just closed up, uh, and obviously that came with huge. Uh, consequences and, and impacts to, to rangers, uh, to rangers and their families and the work that they do, the ability to work, the security of their work, etc. Um, and so, you know, that one of the things that came out is, you know, the, the health profession uh, and, the, and the sort of focus on the health professions globally as, uh, as really being frontline workers um, and essential workers as well. And you've got others, uh, you know, police forces and so on um, that are, are, are labeled as essential workers. However, rangers um, weren't necessarily labeled as essential workers. And I think in terms of the role that they play in, you know, for example, just some of the activities that they carry out, protecting and conserving, restoring natural and cultural values in the protected and conserved areas and wider landscapes um, is all critical. Um, you know, to our survival as, as a species um, and obviously other species as well. So the current sort of what's been labeled as the twin crises of the world, um, but they, they're actually in, integrated and uh, directly related. And that is the, the, the issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, and 
we believe that as the you know the the way to to address that is going to come down to the work of rangers the role of rangers in 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 really making a big difference in achieving many of these targets uh, is going to be driven by the people on the ground and therefore um, we believe that rangers are uh, frontline workers and they are addressing and are critically critical to addressing the, the sort of planetary health component um, and and that's where I think essentially that's where it comes from. And then rangers are doing, you touched on it before, they're in remote locations, they're doing a very dangerous job, they're facing threat from armed humans, dangerous animals, sicknesses, accidents, I mean it's a, it's a very very stressful job. Um, how do you then help to combat these challenges? Sure, um, yeah, it, it's it's something of great concern to to us as the International Ranger Federation. So, so maybe just a, a sort of a step back. We do try and track the number of ranger uh, fatalities worldwide, um, and and that gives us an indication of how dangerous the job is. Um, and we are in the process of, you know, we've refining our ability to to track that obviously over time the challenge with recording range of deaths um, some go unreported um, for for different reasons uh, so it's and obviously by nature that ranges are in remote places and, and not uh, we don't get to hear everything but from the the trends that we're seeing um, it's, it's been very interesting in terms of analyzing um, where how rangers are dying and, it, and it's quite striking in, and um, actually uh, distressing to see what what these are so you know in the in, since 2006 to 2021 uh, we've seen 1,505 rangers uh, killed and um, that is really tragic and unfortunately uh, with that 42 percent are actually homicide related um, so rangers getting murdered um, and often, you know, by poachers or through militia groups, etc. You know, are, are basically criminals who who are, are killing rangers. That's forty-two percent of their deaths, which is really unacceptable. Um, last year, we we lost uh, one hundred and twenty-six rangers. Um, again, every ranger death is is really um, one too many. In time that the range of deaths are you know it's a, it's a dangerous profession and, and as you said you know the um there's dangerous animals that unfortunately the irony is that sometimes rangers are killed by the very animals that they're protecting um which is which is which is sad but um rangers know that and, and that's how it is but um you know there's there's homicides um that uh, the rangers are getting killed said 42 percent animal attacks vehicle accidents is coming out as a huge one um, and drownings and and fire related incidences as well uh, and uh, and then on duty death um, which is has a whole list of other um, reasons for the death but we, we are we're we looking at these these uh, trends um, so things that like animal attacks um, we're seeing an increase in that uh, and it's quite we, we need to look at that carefully because it's not as if there's more animals that we, we we're getting more more a range of deaths um, it's more the pressures on those animals uh, at, that's being exerted uh, there's increased human wildlife conflict so that's that's something that we need to look at the vehicle accidents again it talks a lot to how do we address that I think it's around training uh, improved safety and uh, um, safety standards and so on that we need to look at for rangers. Uh, drowning uh, and fire is definitely an issue of training, better equipment. So there's lots of things that we can take out of these that we can learn and, and look to be proactive in our responses. Um, one of the other things that was, wasn't included here, which is also quite distressing, is, is um, the number of, of rangers that are dying from heart attacks um on duty uh, there's been an increase in that and then also in it, what, uh, one is um that we're monitoring quite carefully because we're not classifying it as a as a uh, on duty death is is suicides and we've seen a huge increase in that as well uh 
so we're surmising that it's, there's an increased amount of stress that rangers are facing in the workplace. Um, that's, that could be drivers behind that. So, so yeah, we've got, to, we've got to look at that very carefully. So in terms of how do, how do we address that, um, I think we can go back to what I feel has been quite a turning point um, in, and a much needed one was the, the last World Ranger Congress. Uh, we had 550 rangers attending um, from 80 different countries. And we came out with a, a declaration, which was the Chitwan Declaration, uh, that really spelled out what needs to be done um, to address these issues that are and threats that are facing rangers. And uh, out of that, uh, we then realized that this is a, a, a huge task uh, at hand to deal with. It's it's massive, and um, certainly not one that uh, just the International Ranger Federation can deal with. And therefore, it, we created um, a partnership, the Universal Ranger Support Alliance. Um, so a number of organizations came together uh, and said, we need to all work together to support rangers at a global level. Um, and, and how do we do that? And I think um, through that, we created the Earth Action Plan. Uh, and that has been, I think, a, a huge, uh, it's expanded our ability to to address things um, that otherwise, as the International Ranger Federation, as an organization, we could never do. So the key taking from there is, is how do we address it? Partnerships are absolutely critical um, to, to helping rangers on the ground. Uh, and, and there's many interventions that are required and that we're working on as well. And you know, just like the video said, you know, we've created a code of conduct, um, which is very helpful. Uh, and that's one of the, the ways, um, interventions that we've got at the moment. Improving working conditions of rangers is, is, is something that's absolutely uh, essential to going forward. And within that is, is addressing some of the other challenges in the workplace itself, uh, particularly around inequalities and, and discrimination. Uh, and that talks to the code of conduct as well. Um, and then the other inequalities in dress, addressing um, representation of, of female rangers, uh, indigenous and or community rangers. Um, so, so there's a lot of work around improving the working conditions of, of rangers. Um, there's also a lot of work required around other support mechanisms to, uh, to rangers. Um, and, I, and that is a little bit harder, but uh, it certainly plays into the sort of advocacy role that we we have as the IRF um, to really tackle um, at a global level uh, these, these global organizations um, to to look at uh, strategic interventions that can drive these these whole wholesale changes um, in the system. You know, ones that you don't necessarily think of the World Bank, for example. Um, and how do we how do we get them to recognise that rangers are critical in any of their partnerships or, or, or um, agreements that they 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 talking about climate change and so on that they make sure that that rangers are forefronted in those. Um, so so that's that's some of the sort of advocacy um, role that we are um, driving together with ERSA as well. Um, one of them is also to uh, you know. For example, support is access to things like simple things like clean water and so on, um, and health insurance, um, adequate insurance for rangers. You know, there was a study done that found that that many rangers just don't do not have any kind of insurance. So they're going out there, putting their life on their life on the line every day, and uh, without that support and knowing that if they pass as breadwinners for their family. They, they they really are putting their family at risk and and so um, that affects them mentally it affects affects the work that, that they do as well um, so it's something that we need to look at too interestingly I think there's another point which um, we often uh, miss out and it's one that certainly worries me uh, is developing the next generation of rangers um, it's a massive challenge we need to get youth inspired uh, to tackle this job. It's, the work of a ranger is not an easy job. Uh, and uh, we need we need to get the next generation of rangers to understand the, the incredible value of a ranger and why um, why it's so important. We know that rangers are, you know, unfortunately, you know, work generally 
uh, under difficult conditions, often in remote areas, and are not necessarily well paid. So it's not necessarily an attractive career, um, but uh, I think it's a, in a, it's a rewarding one, and it's one that the world needs. So certainly it's something that we need to remember is, is, is developing the, the next generation. Um, and then, yeah, always being mindful of the work that rangers are doing, uh, finding new ways to articulate um, to people the, the value of rangers, um, raising the profile of rangers and changing the profile as well. Uh, a ranger is not necessarily someone who is dressed in camouflage and carries a gun. Um, that is, you know, there's plenty of other roles that rangers carry out and we need to show that. And it's not just a, a ranger you know, protecting rhinos. It's it's a ranger who's you know conducting um, monitoring on on a beach of you know looking at turtles. Um, you know the, the roles are so diverse, and we need to recognise that. And I think one of the areas which we uh, which has actually came as a shock. I didn't realise that when we followed up on uh, the profession of being a ranger is that the international labour organisation doesn't even recognise. A ranger as a profession, um, so it, so that's the, something that we really are working towards to get being a ranger recognised as, as a global profession, um, because that that has huge ramifications um, in terms of employment uh, standards and so on around the world. So so yeah, I think um, there's many interventions that um, are, are required. I think we're looking at finding the best way to address this. Um, and yeah, I think there's where the world is today. Um, I think it's been very timely to to bring rangers to the fore and raise the profile. We've just had COP uh, 26, the climate change COP, and we've got biodiversity COPs that are taking place. All these global targets are being set, and we know that many of them, uh, if not all of them, have never actually been achieved to date. Um, so we are looking at this and going, well, one of the targets is looking at uh, securing 30% of, of the planet's surface area uh, and put it under protection. And at the moment, we are looking at it and going, well, do we have enough ranges? Currently, we don't have enough ranges to deal with the current protected areas and also the, the um, conservation areas. Uh, how are we going to do that going forward? So any of these these global plans need to understand that there's a human element to it. Um, you know, wildlife's not going to take care of itself. We have to have the human element there to secure it. And I honestly believe that with our rangers and the work that they do, uh, we'd be in a very, very different position to where we are today. So these are some of the big, big questions that are out there and some of the uh, bigger issues that we're looking to address as the IRF. And I mean, you touched on it a, a little bit there just now, um, but do you think that there, there has been a change in attitudes towards the, the work of a ranger and their importance? For example, I know now there's a lot of awards that are around that rangers um, can get entered in and get global recognition and that kind of stuff. Um, do you think that that is helping to make a difference and keeping people motivated? I'd like to think so. Um, I, I really do. And I think, um, you know, the, the, there's so many unsung heroes out there uh, that um, having been part of these uh, various awards, it's, it's always incredibly humbling to, to read uh, the work that these people are carrying out. And um, I mean, it, movies should be made about these people in terms of the incredible work that they're doing. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think we're doing every, everything we can to, to really raise the profile and put, put rangers out there and, and for them to understand that, that uh, people value the work that they do. And it might seem mundane to a ranger out there uh, you know, working really hard, but it's to know that actually there's many, many people around the world who are actually supporting that person and thinking and valuing the work that they do. So it's something we've got to work harder. Uh, we, we, you know, continually telling the stories of rangers. Um, and, uh, and I think also, you know, we, we, we 
that's part of our membership is drawing from our membership and getting members to talk about their work, to raise the profile of their work, to change the narrative as well. Um, so yes, I think we, we definitely have, a difference has been made, but we far away from where we would like to be. Yeah. And if people are watching back home and they want to be able to support the work that you guys are doing, what's what's some of the ways that they can do this? Yeah, so we'd really, um, from the International Ranger Federation, there's, as I mentioned, there's a whole structure to, to the, as a federation, we've got ranger associations. Uh, we work across um, uh, seven regions around the world. Uh, so it would be great if people would like to, to work with International Ranger Federation. Um, there's, we're always looking for volunteers in terms of skills. Um, there's a range of different skills that really can assist. Um, you know, things like media and design, translation, etc. Um, yeah, many of these are not skills that uh, unfortunately we carry within our membership as rangers. Um, so, so we we need to draw on uh, the support of people who have those skills. Uh, anyone who would like to sort of make a make a donation to to IRF, particularly around equipment, any ideas as well, um, it'd be really. And um, and then if uh, if people would like to also just donate to specific causes as well. As I said, you can contact your the, the range associations that are in your region, um, and that is you can look that up on our website or get in contact with us directly, and also support uh, projects like the Fallen Ranger Fund. We work uh, with our partner organisation, the Thin Green Line Foundation, um, where we try and support rangers, um, families uh, in the case of a ranger who dies in the line of duty. Uh, we try and do everything that we can to try and provide some kind of support to the families of those rangers um, that have fallen. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a number of ways. Number one, get in touch, have a look at our, our media pages. Uh, so we've got social media pages, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And, yeah, get started with the conversation and, and we will engage with you. Yeah, I think it's a very valid point. A lot of time people think it's all just money that people need, but actually it's a lot of different skill sets that people can volunteer their time and their, their special skills too to help you guys. Um, okay, yeah. so I've only got one more question left and then we'll start to wrap up. If you're watching back home and you'd like to put a question to Chris, please then pop it in the comments section and I will do exactly that for you. Um, so Chris, I know you've been working in this industry for a while. What's, what's your favorite success story? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's a it's a very interesting question because um, I think uh, in con in conservation uh, we, we we take any win we can anything is anything that any gain is classified as a success um, and and we've got to celebrate those. Uh, but for me, one of the, I think one of the the greatest things that I've been involved in um, has been uh, working when I was working as, as the chairman of the Game Rangers Association of Africa and working with rangers there. We were able to set up the first uh, ranger insurance uh, support scheme. And it might seem a little bit mundane. It's not it's not uh, out there in the field. You know, uh, we, we do that saving rhinos and elephants and so on. But really, in terms of trying to provide that support to, to rangers on the ground, where we were able to get uh, uh, um, an insurance package together that provided uh, life insurance as well as medical support, including evacuation support, um, to uh, what's over now a thousand rangers who are getting that over many different countries in Africa. Um, for me, that's that's kind of, I think, one of the biggest successes that I, I've been involved in all, and very rewarding as well um, to know, to have rangers who are working, for example, in the Zambezi Valley, 250 rangers who now have medical insurance um, at, for, you know, for $30 for the year. Um, it's a small amount, uh, but can make a huge difference. And we have seen it since it started, the impact that it's made where rangers' lives have been saved, you know, literally through medical evacuation. Uh, and then obviously in terms of just having some kind of support, you know, as I said, few rangers are not well paid. Uh, and when 
you know, if they if they do any death or disability that takes place, they they're incredibly vulnerable, um, and their families are as well. So, so yes, I, I think that that would probably be one of the, the success stories. I love it. I mean, it makes such a difference to their lives just knowing that if something did happen, that then they you know they're not in a whole world of trouble. Um, we've got a question coming through from Winnie. Hi, Winnie. Always lovely to see you. Um, if you, she's asking, if you had more vehicles, would that help rangers at all, and also keep them safer from poachers? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, re sort of equipment uh, and resources are always a, an issue, and I think um, uh, rangers always uh, require increased support, and vehicle support is obviously vital to. To in many parts of the world, I mean, in some places it's boats that they need. Um, so you know, um, so yes, I think it does make it would make a a difference. Uh, I mean, you could it's just uh, and it would probably be across the board, uh, across the globe. Many uh, countries would welcome that uh, uh, additional vehicle support, um, but I think there's unfortunately I think there's many other interventions that are required in addition to that one. And then we've got another question asking um, that how basically can ranger services, uh, he's highlighting here DR Congo, but um, to be supported without international donations? Yeah, so it, it, that's an interesting question. And it's one that we're tackling at the moment is to see how do we secure um, more sustainable uh, levels of funding um, and it's not just the Congo I mean we've got challenges in in, in other countries uh, and, and it's, it's distressing when we hear that uh, you know some in the Congo for example some of the rangers are, are actually having to buy their own equipment um, because otherwise they can't do their work uh, they uh, and you know unfortunately it's that double-edged sword as well we can't get um, uh, international donations funding the state ranger's salaries uh, because I think that's an abdication of duty from the state to 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 fund their own ranger teams. Um, so it shouldn't be left up to other sources of income that are not necessarily dependable. So, you know, that goes back to the question or, or, or the, what I was saying about essential workers, um, you know, recognized as such that you can't you can't look at um, uh taking the, the 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 salary of the rangers and 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 asking someone you know paying it through donations i think it's a it's a high risk and we've certainly seen that through covid yeah. so in terms of the alternatives um i think the, we are looking at a number of different mechanisms um as i say we've engaging with the likes of the world bank um and and they've done some interesting studies on on how to value rangers um there's a whole sort of the carbon market side um, and I know that uh, so there's work that's been done about uh, the carbon value of, of, of forest elephants, so you know, particularly uh, pertinent to, to the, the tropical areas of, of Africa. Uh, and that's a sort of a, a payment mechanism. And it's something that's being explored that an, um, an elephant might be worth $1.7 million um, over its lifetime in terms of its carbon sequestration ability. So, so therefore, you know, we need to look at these alternative options because there's funding that's required for not just state ranges. Uh, there's also community ranges that, that also need to get paid and they're not formally employed. Um, so, yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and it's something that we need to work on, ensuring that we we don't end up like COVID, where, for example, too many certainly a lot of places were dependent on foreign tourism um, to to fund their ranges. And when that dried up, uh, the the ability of the rangers to do their work dried up as well. Um, so it it has meant that we need to really look at the funding models, um, probably. Red, you know, relative to each context, but we do have to develop more robust and resilient uh, funding models. Yeah, I mean, it's such a huge task, but thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Is there anything that you would like to say before we say goodbye? No, just thank you very much um, for, for this. And I think, uh, thank you too for, for hosting uh, so many of uh, the other conservation people and many of them are rangers. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's really great to get their story. Uh, I know that you had someone like uh, Nacha Jeffrey on the other day and uh, from Nigeria, and he's doing incredible work. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I'd just like to say a big thank you to you. And then also obviously a big thank you to all the rangers out there who, who do such incredible work. And a big thank you to their families as well for for allowing them to do that work because it's it's not an easy thing being a family member of a ranger. Um, but uh, yeah, standing behind and supporting the ranger is a is a strong family and um, network that is incredibly important as well. Yeah, completely agree. So any rangers who are watching this back home, thank you so much for the work you are doing. And please know that we are behind you and supporting you 100%. Um, so thank you, everyone, for watching back home. Thank you, Chris, for coming on. If you've liked the show, please give it a like, comment or a share. The more people who see it, the more awareness we can raise for conservation and the different organisations that are working within it. Um, but for now, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>